And the Lauren Hope Glory Show. As you know, we try to bring you amazing guests from all over the world, and today is no different. It's 1 a.m. here in the morning, and I'm just about to connect to David Nino Rodriguez, who's uh, I think he's in Texas. Um, and uh, just a little bit about him. He apparently he broke Tyson's first round knockout record by knocking out his opponents 24 times in the first round. I haven't got a clue how that happened, and maybe I will ask him. Um, he was the heavyweight number 13, ranked by the WBC in the world. And he's written a book called When the Lights Go Out, which is uh, basically he wrote that after there was an attempted murder on him, and he was left seriously injured so it's wonderful to have him here well healthy doing lots of work he does a lot of work to support bullying with kids and also a lot of work to help release the kids um, that have been sex trafficked so let's find out what david wants to talk about first and then we'll come on moving on tv and give you an amazing amazing show as usual so take care and let's get him on. Hi there, David. How are you? So hi there. Hi, David. How do, what do I call you? David Nino or Nino or David? What would you like me to call you? Uh, you just call me Dave. Okay, Dave that's easy. <laughs> the, the Nino days are way over now. I'm viejo. <laughs> okay. Okay. So how is it? You're in Texas at the moment. Is that right? I'm in El Paso, Texas. Correct. Okay, and I expect it's absolutely boiling there, really, really hot. It's, it's really just too hot. It's like 110, it's like you do anywhere between 100 and 110, right. and uh, it's, it's, it's miserable. I can't get my grass to grow. Oh, right, <laughs> okay. Well, we dying. That's no. sad. That's sad. Well, we've had we're having a heat wave, but luckily, we also have rain because I have an allotment where we're growing our own vegetables now and you know so it's really exciting so but we have to go there and do the watering okay um, i just want to talk to you about a couple of things i know absolutely nothing about boxing but my father it was a little orphan a little jewish orphan was uh, kind of fostered off the street into a family where both his brothers were boxers so uncle ben and uncle vic they were both boxers and my dad used to talk a lot about uh, Mickey Duff. I don't know if you know any of these names, if it makes any sense. What, what was it, Mickey who? Mickey Duff. He was quite no, famous no. manager. I mean, I know, I days. guess this is back in the older days. <laughs> yeah, back in the older yeah. days. Let's not go there. <laughs> That's what <laughs> I was talking about. Um, okay, so all I knew is that dad, also in the orphanage, they used to have um, boxers coming to them and training them because they were the Jewish, obviously. And me and my dad, we wrote a book together. And he said in the book that um, they taught him how to stand up for himself, that he used to, they used to come to the orphanage because, as I say, there was a lot of anti-Semitism. Again, without going into details of what you've been talking about. <laughs> and so... The boxers used to, these famous boxers used to come to the orphanage and they teach the kids how to box and how to stand up for themselves. So that could kind of lead nicely into the fact that you did a lot of work with kids that were bullied. Is that right? Do you want to take yeah, I have a, I have an organization. I have an organization called, uh, uh, it's Nino Strong 
and it's called uh, KO Bullying. And we go to different schools all over Texas. And I speak to auditoriums full of kids about being bullied. I give my testimony as a, I was bullied as a kid. I was a scared little kid for a really long time. And, uh, you know, to the point where I would even consider myself a coward, really, when I was a kid. And uh, I snapped out of it somewhere, you know, towards the end of high school. And I became the bully, which wasn't a good thing. So I, I became the, 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 the direct and opposite of what I used to be. And then I, you know, all of that, you know, through my whole existence as a, as a child, really, um, five years old up until about 15, I was picked on all the time. And that's what turned me into the type of fighter that I was that became a heavyweight champion fighter was because I, I, um, how I was constantly battling against that. And I, I, I recognized that in my later years after I retired from boxing and I decided to get back to the community and, and actually go out and help kids and I, and let them know like, Hey, if this guy was bullied and, or if this guy was a champion, a champion boxer, and he was bullied, then I'll be okay too. So I try to talk to kids about that and like, listen, it, it happens to the best of us. And, and, um, it builds character and that's what I try to, that's what I try to get breakthrough to them. Fantastic. That's really important. It's really important. Now I've got a couple of facts about you that my husband kind of did a little bit of Wikipedia checking a few things out. And he said that, um, as I say, I know nothing about boxing, but I'm just going to say that you broke Tyson's first round knockout record. Um, by knocking out um, op his opponents, your opponent, sorry, 24 times in the first round. <laughs> now, 25. did you do that? I mean, did you do Kung Fu with them? <laughs> did you no, I, I was just what a really fast starter. Uh, no, I mean, well, Tyson was heavyweight champion of the world. Let's not get that wrong. You know, he, he made it to a pinnacle that, I'll, that I never reached. Um, I was a top ranked contender but a six belt heavyweight champion in, 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 in different belts. But uh, yeah, I have, the facts are there. I have 25 first round knockouts and there's nobody that I know of right now that has that many. So yeah, I mean, I made history myself and I'm very proud of that. How did you do it? <laughs> uh, I was just a real, I, I would, I, you know, my boxing ability was, uh, I was a sharpshooter. I knew how to, I, I warmed up a lot in the dressing room. When I came out into the ring, I was ready to go. I, di I didn't take any time to warm up. And I, have, I had explosive power with both hands. And I was very fast, very fast mm -hmm. for big guys. So once I connected, it was like, it was just hitting that sweet spot. And just they would just, bing, it would be over. They'd get knocked out. And I was vicious. I knew how to attack the body and the head. So I had killer liver shots. And, and my left hook was really my bread and butter. <laughs> right, OK. Okay, well, again, that, you know, how to do that, as I say, it's just fascinating that you could actually do that so quickly in the first round. Now, another connection I have to boxing is, again, I don't know if you're going to re recognize this name, but I played the part of Edith Piaf, the French singer. I toured all over the country, you know, with No, Rien, de Rien. Now, you know that. Oh, wow. Everyone knows that song, but... Here is the connection. The love of her, of her life was Marcel Serdan, who was a very, very famous boxer. Have you heard of Marcel Serdan? Mar Marcel who? Serdan. C -E no, I don't. I, no, you're giving okay. me names I've never heard of, which is okay. putting me to shame here. <laughs> I'm trying to find the common denominators here. <laughs> in one of the scenes, she stands here as she watches him with her, his opponent as he crumbles like a melting candle in front of me, you know, as I say, and, and, and that was my connection. These are my connections to boxing. And uh, so, <laughs> you know, in order to find um, interesting things to discuss with you, because um, this is just basically going to move us on now to something else. So how long did you do your boxing for and why did you stop? What happened? Oof, I boxed all my life. Uh, I started at five years old uh, from being picked on as a kid. My dad put me, they took me to the boxing gym in the ghetto at a very young age. And I started boxing at that age. And I didn't really come into myself until I was about 14, 15 years old, uh, which is about the time I started standing up for myself. And turned pro at 21. 
I, I uh, built a record of 36 and 0, uh, and it all came crashing down on me when, um, you know, I, I tell everybody, you know, I was, um, towards the end of my career, I was, uh, um, I had a lot of stress and a lot of pressure for my career, and I guess I didn't know how to handle it too well, and I started drinking. I was, I was um, juggling two extremes, being a pro athlete and being an alcoholic. And I basically uh, was walking out of a bar one night, and as I was walking out, thugs came behind me and slit my throat. And when they slit my throat, you can see it. Uh, I almost died. I got 369 stitches. Uh, I was in a coma for a, a day and a half. They also stabbed my friend and uh, changed my life forever. They didn't kill me, but they took away my career. And I wasn't able to successfully come back and fight. I came back and lost twice. And um, that was pretty much all she wrote, you know. I did come back the third time and win by knockout. And uh, I threw out my back. And then that was really, to me, God telling me, like, hey, I need you for other things. Boxing is not your way anymore. It is time to move on. So yeah. I listened to God, and I tried to move on. But for about four years, I suffered massive, massive, major depression, suicidal. You know, I thought it would have been better for me to just die and have to go through what I was going through. And um, I came out of it, you know, I, I came out of it and I feel like it's like a, a, a caterpillar that goes into a cocoon to become a butterfly. I became a much better person, a person that service to others instead of service to self. So as I went through that cocoon of change, I became a different person and it was a very hard time for me. It was a very dark, very, 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 very depressing. It was like a black channel of like just um, negativity and drinking and drugs and anything to fill the void except God, you know. And but I always had that oh, little can I stop spark. You there? Sorry, Nino, can I stop you there, please? Yeah, David. And um, when you say God, um, what is your concept of God? Because um, a lot of people, they don't like to think about God um, as a religious thing. I mean, I'm Jewish. I grew up in Israel and God was always that man in the sky that was writing whether you're a good person or not. And my awakenings happened when I realized that God is a power that we have inside ourselves and the connection that we have to each other to do the work we're doing. So I'd be very interested in hearing what your concept is of God. God is a ethernet of super consciousness, a source of loving energy that you tap into. And we're all part of like drops in the sea that make up the ocean. Um, so when I say God, I'm not thinking about a guy up in the clouds with a beard and a pair of testicles t telling everybody what to do. <laughs> I, I see God as an ever loving source of energy that will never turn his back on you or never punish you. He will teach you lessons. And I use the word he, you know, figuratively. It's, you know, sure. I'm not, I, you know, God knows no sex, okay. nor does he know no color. Uh, God is ever loving um, energy. And I believe that he is source energy. And we all go back to God when we die, like a USB drive, hard drive. Like we go and connect our experiences back into the super conscious ethernet. I think we're all experiencing our reality and God is experiencing it through us. And when we die, we go and our, our, we kind of download our experiences back to the ever loving source of the creator. And that's how he, it's almost like God needs us as much as we need God. Like we are reflections of God to himself. So I don't know if that makes sense that, that, you know, it, you know, we kind of, okay. So that's the best way I can explain it. But I believe that, the ultimate hell would be void of God, not having your connection to the source. So I don't like also when people say, oh, we are God. We are God. God, I am God. No, I don't believe we are part of the source, but we are not the source. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we must derive our strength from the ultimate source, which is God. Um, I do have a, a different belief. You know, I'm not Jewish or anything like that. I do believe in Jesus Christ that he came down with a mission to um, teach us the way. Um, but um, I respect all religions. I do. I believe any, you know, anyone who feels whatever resonates with the person, 
I, I respect it. What resonates with me is Christ, but I'm not going to go around beating people's door down to tell them what, you know, what, what my truth is. That's my personal truth. And I have no right to go and, 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 and beat people's doors down and tell them what I believe in. I, I can tell them what I believe in, but it's up to them to, to want to believe in what they want to believe. Um, so for me, I believe in Christ and I believe in God as source energy. Um, and that's just the best way I can put it. And, and, uh, I hope that answers your question. I don't know. <laughs> Completely, totally. And I believe it's the same. I believe that we're all the Christ now um that we're all here. you believe in christ consciousness yes exactly okay christ consciousness exactly and we're all here basically to do the work to bring us all together to save humanity but again that's a, a huge subject so coming back to what you were saying so you basically you were injured really badly um these people they beat you up and you they basically you nearly died is that well right? they didn't beat me up they didn't beat me up they just slit my throat and they tried took to, off yeah. well that was <laughs> it yeah they tried to kill you um and you around that time you had some kind of awakening did you something that made you realize because your story again sounds a bit similar to um casey armstrong who runs wmap radio and he used to work with Howard Stern and he had a similar story. He was very, very deep into drugs and drink. Maybe not you weren't into drugs, but drinking. And he was nearly killed a few times and he had this awakening, very similar. And then he went out to run World well, Most Amazing People to give back to the, to the community and to give back to the universe. So a lot of us have gone through similar situations. I think I call us star seeds that we're not from here, but we came here to go through a certain amount of suffering that we feel. So we feel the empathy with those who are vulnerable and we can go ahead and help them. But tell us about a bit more about what happened to you. Um, did you get into something like the 12 steps where you found that God, that higher power, or just, did it just happen for you? No, I've always had a natural uh, connection with God, and 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 uh, I've always had a natural connection to my awakening. I've, I, you know, I started wait what you want to call the awakening process, mm -hmm. uh, probably when I was about twenty years old, eighteen, nineteen, twenty years old. I've always questioned everything. I'm younger than that, even, um, I've always questioned authority. Right? I was always trouble at school, and I never listened to anybody. I always did what I want to do anyway. Um, but you know. As I started getting older, I started seeing things for the way it was in this matrix that we live in. And I started wondering about who are the controllers? Who are the people who are in charge of this system? And who controls them? And as I started diving deeper, probably in my early 20s, I started realizing our reality, our reality is not what it seems. And I started researching feverishly when I'd be in training camps and boxing training camps. And I started, as I started getting more famous and boxing and rubbing shoulders with people that were celebrities. I started like really paying attention to my surroundings and seeing behaviors and um, just uh, questioning the way things were around me. And um, I, I just started my, the evolution of my growth just started rapidly taking off. And it wasn't until about 2007, 2000, it really 2000, yeah, 2007, 2008, that I really started questioning 9-11 and how it was, it was obvious to me an inside job. I started questioning, you know, even when I saw 9-11 happening, that was really like to me, like I've seen Las Vegas buildings go down, brrr, demolition style. And when that happened live on television, I was like, that was a demolition. Mm. And I knew it. And so then and right then and there, I knew the gig was up. I knew something was up. Mm. And when I looked more into it, I knew, okay, this, there's something definitely really really wrong here and um and i started really uh i started a campaign for truth and i'm not claiming to know it all i don't know it all i have theories but i know the agenda they're spinning on mainstream uh media and the narrative they're giving giving us is is completely false so i know that much you know and that's all i claim to know but I, I love to have an open mind and I, and I love to be a voice for the people. I listen to everybody, whether I think they're wrong or right, I still try to listen to them because everyone is a sum total of their experiences. So they, they have a right to speak. 
Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. It's interesting because I interviewed um, uh, David Mahoney about 9-11. And uh, it's inter my big awakening happened after that because, as I said, I grew up in Israel. I'm, I'm Jewish and I'm Irish. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I was taken to Israel at a young age and unfortunately indoctrinated. I was in the army, all sorts of stuff. I knew it wasn't right. I never felt comfortable. I hated it the minute I got there. But I was brought up to believe what they wanted me to believe about the Arabs being the bad guys and, the, you know, the Israelis being the good guys. After 9-11, I had a massive, massive meditation where I saw the truth. I saw the truth and I knew. And it's completely changed the whole of my perception and my beliefs. And bit by bit, I woke up. But I've had huge episodes of awakening. And as you say, you know that something's not right. And you're going out there and, and you're trying to tell people. And, and you want them to do something. And, and they're just not listening. And they, they just don't want to know. So let's come back a little bit. Because we'll talk about that in a minute as well but can you tell me a little bit about your book when the lights go out um is yeah actually the attempt i have it right here <laughs> yeah tell us a bit about the book you wrote it uh, it's a book i wrote during a time after boxing when i retired around 2016 when i was in a deep state of depression and i wrote this book basically as a memoir to my family because I wanted to commit suicide. And I know a lot of people can't believe that when I say that, but I wanted to leave behind something for my family and I didn't want to publish it. Um, I wrote it in a state of massive depression, frustration. My life just blew up on me. My career blew up on me and I had no real purpose to move on. So I started reflecting on my life and trying to think back on everything. So I just took a pen to the paper and I started writing actually no a thumb to the text I, I wrote the whole i wrote the whole book on my on my iphone believe it or not my thumb i had like 10 to 90s on my thumb and um i wrote it within a month that's how much stuff i had in my mind and my soul that i downloaded it all into a book and i really started thinking back like what made me box what what how did that define who i was and i started doing a self-reflection so the whole book is really me having a self-reflection on my life and writing it down and that's what i did and i and i ended up publishing the book and it's on amazon and it's called when the lights go out and it's uh it, it's about a it's a life that's full circle how it started off with me being bullied uh, all the depression going into the going into the ranks being a fighter coming out getting stabbed going through depression again and then helping kids that were bullied themselves so it's like a life of full circle yeah. and, and i wrote the book and it's actually helped a lot of kids a lot of kids right until this day or come up to me on the streets and I'll pass and say, hey, man, your book, your book changed my life. Oh, that is incredible, isn't it? That is yeah, that, if, if I did anything in my life, I'm proud of that book. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. We're all here with a mission. And if you can save one life, you know, it, you've done everything. It's, it's incredible. It's amazing to be able to do that. And so, um, so basically, yeah, something that I was thinking of as you were saying that, is the way we're living at the moment. Um, there's so many young people that um, are getting post-traumatic stress and depression and yeah. mental health issues, which I don't believe in. You know, it's just a way to keep people quiet <laughs> a lot of the time. But how would you, so you're saying with this book, you've helped a lot of young people. So if someone was watching this and they were young and they're depressed and as I say, also the situation we're living in is going to cause a lot of shock. It's the only way you could put it for young kids are growing up in a completely unnatural situation, a completely unnatural way of living with so much confusion that, you know, they really don't know what to do after time. What would you say to them at the moment about how to get over this? Where, where should they be putting their energy? How can you help them in some way to negotiate what's really going on out there? Because, you know, if they, a lot of the time, their peers, their families are telling them the narrative, you know, and, and they're probably questioning things and they don't know what to do. So they need someone 
like you, someone that's come through and is strong enough to be able to help them. So how could you, what would your message be to these young kids? Two things. Number one, always believe in God. Always believe in God and that God loves you. Always believe in God. That's the most, that's the first and foremost thing. Believe in God. Okay. That's number one. Number two, never give up on your dreams. Never give up on your dreams. Dreams, when you stop dreaming, that's when you stop dying. That's when you start dying. So to me, dreaming is everything. You know, whether it's you want to be a musician, whether you want to be an actor, whether you want to be an athlete, keep going for your dreams. Keep believing in them. Don't let anybody tear them away. You know, and always have an outlet. You know, whether if you want to be a musician, start playing music. The only one that can stop you is you. Everyone told me when I was growing up that I would, eh, what are you going to box for? You're going to get your head beat in. Uh, eh, you'll never be champion. You'll never this. You'll never that. And then I, I didn't listen to them. I followed my own star, and I believed in God. So you believe in God, and you follow your dreams. And mm -hmm. let everyone else who's tearing you down and making fun of you and insulting you Kick them to the curb. Don't worry about them. Only believe in God and yourself. That's it. Believe in your dreams. Okay. Believe in God. And go achieve your dreams. All of the bullying, all of the scrutiny, all of the criticism only define, only will build your character. And it'll be that much more sweet when you get to your goal. And you can write a book yourself one day. <laughs> well, yeah. Everyone has a story. I, I'm trying to write my life story. I was writing it quite a lot until the lockdown and then because I grew up in wars and terrorism and all sorts of stuff in Israel I kind of got a bit confused with what was going on I never believed this thing from the beginning I knew that this was just a flu bug you know I've been in to natural medicine for so long but when the lockdown happened it was just like hang on a second is this really happening you know, and it really kind of well picks you up in so many ways. But again, just, just to talk a little bit more about the God thing, because a lot of young kids, as I said, they don't want to know. They don't want to know about God. They don't want to hear about it. So how, again, can you get them when you say believe in God? I'd say that the way that I woke up, because I was very angry, I had a very, very difficult childhood, like yourself, I, I had all sorts of things happen to me in Israel, which I tell everyone, it's, it's out there in a book that was written about me, abuse and everything, all sorts. And my, my belief was, as I said, I have absolutely no belief in God whatsoever. To me, that was no way. I'm not going there, religion or anything like that. And then I, I got into the 12 steps because of codependency and eating, an eating disorder. And I found the higher power. And to me, that was the beginning of being able to understand there is a power greater than me. And bit by bit, that developed into the spiritual awareness that I have now. So how, how would you put that more into a context for a young person now? Because as I said, their, their world is chaos. And what I keep telling people as well, David, and you know what I mean by this is, we say where we go one, we go all, don't we? Because you cannot rely on, on God or one person or even a group of people to fix us. As you said, it's all got to come from inside of us. Everything has got yeah, but to, God, God gives got you strength. to join that connection, haven't we? And so, but if someone said to me, a young person now, um, where was God, for example, because when the Holocaust happened? And, and that's how I would explain it, is it's not about looking outside of you and expecting someone to come and fix you. You've got to come together as a collective and do it. So how, how do you do that with young people? Because you obviously have a lot. Do you understand where I'm coming from here? There's an old saying, the teacher's always quiet during the test. And when you look at life that way, and you understand that this is just a game to be played, and that we have multiple and consistent tests, sometimes God is testing you, and he's wanting to see how you pass that test. 
And I firmly believe that. God has all has made every single and each of one of us uh, in his in his in his uh, image, and I believe that. And I believe we're here to make a better planet, a better world, and it's each to each to up to, up to each uh, to one of us to do that, to to uh, apply that and make this earth a better place. But we, but our source and our energy comes from God. And I, I every time I got in the ring or every time I trained or I was going into a hard sparring session I always got still and I prayed and I went in the restroom or I wouldn't go in the locker room and I would pray and say Lord center me for this battle I'm about to go into be with me and I would feel his presence and I every single time I, I did amazing it was only when I lost sight of that that I did not so God is always there for you to draw strength from mm -hmm. and that comes to faith okay I go outside, I look at every blade of grass, I look at the trees, I look at the sky, and I say, wow, who was the mastermind? Who is the engineer behind this matrix? What an amazing, amazing creation. Now, that's how I see it. You know, so when you're being tested, just remember the teacher's always quiet during the test. And it's up to you to get through the test, but you can always draw from the energy of God. You can always ask for help. God's always there. My mom always says, my mom always says, just pick up the phone. He's always on the other line. Just pick up the phone. <laughs> you know, that's it. <laughs> so what kind of upbringing did you have? Did you have a good family upbringing? What, I, I was very fortunate. I was very fortunate in the sense that my mom, my dad were great parents. I know not everyone's as fortunate, but um, uh, yeah, I, I, my mom and dad are 85 and 80 now. And uh, they're they're my treasure. They're my gem. I take I take care of them now. Mm -hmm. um, I try to be a good son, you know. And and um, they're my whole world. Mm, that's amazing. That that's really good because, as you say, a lot of kids don't have that. They don't have that important, powerful, positive influence when they're growing up, and they get lost. And you know, that's what we have a lot of that in society at the moment. So. Okay, so let's get to the truth thing and the awakening thing. So tell us a little bit more about how you woke up and how you actually formed your opinion about what's going on in the world that we're seeing now. And also, what do you think is going on? What do you think is actually Well, I think, I think there's a elite Satanists that run the world. And that's that, all the research I've done, I see that plain sight. Uh, they do not have human kind as a uh, priority they they don't care about us they hurt us they 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 want to call the herd they are they are very sick psychopathic individuals um and they are the controllers they are they're the dominant controllers of this planet they've been this it's been this way for hundreds if not thousands of years mm -hmm. and i feel it's time for humanity to break away from that controlling slavery bondage and the great awakening to me is people waking up to this idea and understanding their power through God mm -hmm. to break away. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I totally agree. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's just what it is. And yeah. it's up to each and every person to do their own research and, and get in touch with their power to do so. It's a collective thing. It's not going to, you know, we all, it's like the ripple effect or the butterfly effect. It's like we all can influence others. I'm, I'm influencing people. I'm influencing people through the internet. You are too. It's like we have a, we have a job to do. And it's as many people as I can influence, then they can influence as well. And they can influence. And it just goes on and on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. and, and that's my objective is, is, is that it's a vibrational energy that I'm putting out there that affects everybody and touches everybody in a certain way that, they can also do that. Everybody can do this. Yeah. And, and how do you manage to stay calm when you've got someone sitting in front of you saying you're a conspiracy theorist? <laughs> I don't worry. I, I, well, first all of all, the evidence is out there, but they still say to you, oh, this is all conspiracy. How it's, it's, it? <laughs> I, I laugh. I, 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 that doesn't affect me. I'll tell you why. Because I used to get in the, in the most honest place is the boxing ring. And I used to get in there and fight the baddest dudes on this planet. And I had people cheering for me and I had people hating me. Now, if I can get in the ring and do that in front of 
thousands of people in the arena and millions watching and probably 80% of them wanting to see my demise. If I wanted to do that, if I could do that, I could do anything, believe me. So when someone sits there and tells me that I'm a conspiracy theorist, I just look at them like they're asleep. Like it's okay. They probably, you know, they're, they're dead asleep. They're in a coma. They haven't woken up yet. It's my job to help wake them up. If they're throwing insults at me, it's only because they don't understand. So I kind of have pity on them. I don't really, I don't take it to heart. I look at them like, you know, I, this isn't going to sound really bad, but like either they have a room temperature IQ and they don't think, or they're just not spiritually awakened yet. So it's one of those two things, and they're both pretty bad. So hopefully, uh, <laughs> you know, that's the way I look at it. I really do. So, <laughs> you know, that I, I, I don't take it to heart. I don't. I get frustrated because I'm like, gosh, how can so many people be asleep? But then again, you know, I think, well, it's not nobody. Not everybody can wake up as fast as I did. Mm -hmm. That's Answer. That's a really good answer. I have to ask you something <laughs> as well about what, through your life um, as a boxer and being involved, as you said, you must have been involved in seeing a lot of the people from the entertainment business and, and you know, Hollywood and all of that. Did you ever get in a situation that wasn't healthy? Did you ever feel that something, <laughs> you're laughing because I told you I'm going to ask you all the questions that nobody else will ask. So you know where I'm going here, don't you? <laughs> hey, I'm going to tell you right now, I lived a Go life on. of luxury <laughs> and, and promiscuous. I was promiscuous. I, I did everything on the other side of the fence, man. I was, I was, a, you know, I was, I wasn't the best. I was never a saint. I'll say that. I was never a saint. I lived a life of, a, it was fun. I treated my body like an amusement park, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. um, you know, I, to me, did I think it was bad at the time? Yeah, it was probably, I probably did, but I was having such a damn good time. I did that, yes, but I, I want to look at another angle there. What I'm saying is, were you ever approached by the 1%? Come on, I mean, look, you were. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, you know, well, they don't do it. you. Well, they were, they don't do yeah. it like that. So they test you out. They. I'll go up see how then. far you'll go with parties okay. and, and and things like that. Okay. And I didn't go I didn't go that far because um, I always drew the line. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was in some situations where I was like, "This is kind of weird. Uh, I don't like it. I don't feel good. My soul wouldn't vibe. It didn't resonate with what was going on. So I'd walk away." But I knew, yeah, I knew of some people that were uh, um, bad apples, man. And I didn't, and I and I knew to stay away from them. Good, good. You know, when I was 15 years old, um, I started singing um, when I was about 13. I was the lead singer, lead children's soloist in the Children's National Choir in Israel. My dad took me to an agent to get me out there. And he said some things to me, oh, you're going to have to go to all these parties and dress differently. And I just knew, I just knew something inside me said, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. And I feel because I was such an impressionable, impressionable child and I had been abused, not by my family. I always say that, thank God. They were just um, ignorant. They sent me back to the family dentist who abused me. And that was my awakening. The minute I realized it wasn't my fault, I had a massive awakening. And, and I was diagnosed with a mental health issue which disappeared, basically. A long story. But what I'm saying is, if I had gone that way, because I was so vulnerable, I would have ended up, you know, one of those kids that we're not going to talk about at the moment, but, um, oh, that fun? So, okay, so, yeah, okay, so basically you, you felt that you weren't going to go any further with what they were getting up to, and, but do you ever, did you ever see it? I never put myself in any compromising situations. Right, good. Well. I mean, now that they would want, at least. Pardon? And not that they would want. You know, I, I never did anything that was, uh, let's say, over the top, you know. Uh, besides me being just promiscuous and drinking a lot and the drugs every now and then, that's about it. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I mean, but I never did anything that was like uh, malicious or satanic or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. 
But did you know anyone at all that was involved around? I heard of people, yeah. I heard yeah. of people, but yeah. I'm not going to name their names. Of course And not. I'm not going to yeah. go into that because then you're stepping over a line that's just not, it's of not, course. you know, it's dangerous. Yeah, I understand. But, I mean, I was discussing this with someone the other day. And I think the big question now is who are the good guys? You know, who isn't doing this kind of thing? Are there a lot of good guys? Or are there? Yeah. Because it doesn't I, like that, does it? The problem is the good guys stay quiet. And they're very passive. They yeah. don't... The, the bad guys control everything. So... If you want to make your way in this world or do anything, you got to play by their rules. And so a lot of good guys just stay quiet and they don't, they, they don't say anything. They don't do anything. So that's the problem we have now is that there's not enough good men speaking up and doing something. Mm. Um, but the people that I, that I know in Hollywood are good people that, that I, as far as I know, um, uh, and I, and I, and you know, I believe in them and they, and I would never give their names because I wouldn't betray, betray their trust. No, of course not. But they rely, they relay a lot of information to me. And, um, yeah, I, I believe they're, and they're, they're the few good people in Hollywood. Okay. When you say they relay information to you, what do you mean? What kind of information? Well, the video I made, the first video I made about uh, Hollywood going down, about four, you know, four months ago, before it even was a thought that it would go down, well, I got my information from them. Right. And they were telling me how Trump was going to take him out and the infrastructure being taken out. So when I, and look what's happening now. Yes. So, you know, so that, that's validation right there. So that's, that's good intel. So I would never give up my, my intel. That's fantastic because I was just about to ask you about Trump. Um, I know that, I mean, I've known that he's okay for quite a while and people used to just, oh, the conversation would go like dead the minute you said Trump is actually a good guy. And now you can see people switching and even my husband is going on Twitter and saying to me, how come Trump is saying this about hydroxychloroquine and stuff like that? And he's getting cut off Twitter as well because he, he's not allowed to tell the truth. So did you always feel that did you always trust that he was okay yeah i mean i don't ever trust anybody 100 percent, but the the vibe i got from trump is a good one mm -hmm. and i feel like he's a good man and he's really trying to do something good for this country and uh i i believe unless i'm mis severely misled that i believe he's a good man and mm -hmm. um and i believe he's in for the good fight and that's just that's my belief and and I think a lot of the evidence points to that. Now, if he decides to make this vaccine mandatory, then I'm gonna I'm gonna pull my Trump card. I won't support him anymore. I don't actually believe that. I think it's a code. I think yeah. I think everything he does is a game and a code because yeah, it could be me. They say I mean, we'll see. They say how come he was with? They ask me. I can usually answer everything now. They said, how come he's a good guy and he was with Epstein and, you know, and uh, people have said things about him, yada, yada. And I say, well, because, first of all, he was probably planted there in order to do what he's doing. And, you know, that's right. fine. And then he walked and then he joined Q. And, you know, the, everyone has a history, David. Everyone has right. a history. And people tend to not forgive that. And um, they tend, yes, he said things that were not congruent with him being what he tries sometimes to show us, even though there's absolutely no evidence of him ever saying anything racist. No, no one can ever find anything. But you see, the answer, as I said to you, is you cannot put all your trust into one person. That's, no, of course not. That's, God said, don't make any idols. Don't create idols. A thousand percent. And I'm being careful not to do that with Trump. I just, yes. I, I feel that, you know, you, you gotta be, you know, you, you have to have um, critical thinking and you gotta be skeptical of everybody, but I, I don't know. I'm, what's our alternative? Is it uh, the deep state and Biden? I mean, is it Hillary Clinton? Absolutely not. So, 
yeah, I, I would say I'm a Trump supporter. If you, like, you let me to choose between those two, yeah. Hillary or Trump, it's going to be Trump. Trump or Biden is going to be Trump. There's no competition on me. There's no competition. I, I but you know that. hey, if I'm fooled and it leads to the same thing, then then so be it. I don't, you know. Listen, we are living in a lot of confusion right now, and anything's yeah. possible. I'm not going to say it's not possible. Yeah. It is possible. I just I don't know, and I'm saying that my gut tells me Trump's a good guy. I believe uh, I subscribe to Q about 70%. I'm not all the way in um, because I never just jump all the way into anything because then it becomes a cult. Uh, I think that you have to have critical thinking. And, and uh, I think time will tell. We shall see. But like I said, I'm not taking the vaccine. Oh, none of us are. Don't worry about that. Yeah, I'm not taking the vaccine. So if none he starts pushing that, then I'll know he was on the wrong side from the get-go, and I'll yeah. pull my trump card immediately. Of course. But like I say, from what I've found out, everything's a code. And when he talks about going from house to house, it means he's draining the swamp. And like yourself, um, the beauty of Q is where we go on, we go all. It's brought us together. It's created a huge consciousness of standing up and saying the whole of London, the whole of England is going to be covered in protests. Do you know what amazing that is? This is the British. The British, they, they, just, they, they just stand there and they don't stand up for themselves like you and guys in America. The whole of the UK is going to be covered in protest. We're not having it anymore. We do not consent to bring down the government, to save the children. And the whole Trump support. Beautiful. That's beautiful. I it's love amazing. It. Absolutely amazing. That's awesome. And, and it's, this is huge. It's an absolute huge awakening. But hello. Yeah, my sorry, my someone's That's calling. Okay. But you see, again, you know, again, I was talking to my husband about this, about as I say, I'm not religious, but in the Ten Commandments, our world has gone in a certain way where people have created celebrities and gods. I said in the Ten Commandments, do not create idols. Yeah. And you make Trump into a god or an idol, he's a human being. I agree with that. He's likely to fail and to make mistakes. He will make mistakes, I think, until he gets in. And all of this could be part of the game that he's playing because he has to get in. But from my meditations, David, um, he, he's the best we have, as you say, but he may not be the one to liberate us. First of all, it's going to be us as a collective. We're going to liberate each other. And I think somebody else, because he's old, he's tired as well. I think sure, I would be too. Junior could be anyone who's going to come after him. But I think everything now is his whole goal is to get in. And so he has to play the game to get in. And he may say things that are not congruent with what we want to hear. But I was told to read between the lines. And that's what I do. And I pray to God and everything that's out there um, that everything we're being told about Q and Trump is actually true. But even I pray it's true as well. Even if it isn't, it doesn't matter because we're waking up and we're annihilating right. that one percent with love. Right. By connecting. I've never seen anything like it. Well, at least people are being aware. Yeah, and they're waking up. And that's the whole objective of all this. You know, I've never seen anything like it, David. I mean, the whole of my, um, for the last probably six years, I've been, well, I've been awake with Big Pharma when I saw what happened to my mom. So more than that, probably 20 years. I wouldn't be walking around now if I took medication because my body was never strong enough. And I was trying to tell people continuously and, I, and nobody would talk to me. I was, they gave me a label, said I was mad. Now we have community groups meeting in the park, hugging, knowing that this is nothing, this, this, this flu bug. I'm, I, I, I interviewed Dr. That's awesome. I interviewed Dr. Rizzo from the Frontline Doctors yesterday. That's going on tonight, hopefully. And he is so incredible. He, he listened to everything and he was smiling the whole time. And I know that these frontline doctors 
know that COVID is totally preventable and curable. They know what's happening here. They know there's something that is standing between them and practicing. And the, this 1%, they're not very, they don't have our common sense and they don't have empathy and they don't have love. And that's where, the, that's their downfall. Yeah. You know, my dad always used to say to me, about Hitler, which I believe was the puppet as well, you know, but he, oh, yeah, they all are. They all were puppets. But my dad always used to say the reason that Hitler lost is because he came too cocky. He became too cocky. He went into Russia and the Russian winter annihilated them because he thought he could do anything. Because he, once you start to think you're God and these things, whatever they are, they're not human. Whatever started this is not human, it's impossible right. that they're human. That's my opinion anyway. Um, I agree. Whatever started this, um, they got too cocky and they started putting it in our face and they didn't realize how much we care and how much we love kids. And um, I've been hearing a, great, a lot of great stuff from Charlie Ward and Mike Shinton, and they're telling me that everything, everything, everything is about releasing the kids and that the kids are being released all the time and in a positive way how did you get into that how did you get involved in in helping to release the kids in a positive way how did i get involved in in what in in he helping with the sex trafficking and stuff like that oh no i didn't <laughs> all i was is just the guy that came and hit the, wa the wasp nest um basically i got information that trump was taking him down Mm -hmm. And I thought about it and I was like, wow, that's some valuable information. People really need to know about that, especially during this quarantine, because I know a lot of uh, people were losing hope. All I was was the messenger. Don't kill the messenger. You know, it was just, a, you know, you can hate the message, but I was just a messenger and it turned out to be correct. And, uh, you know, whatever happens from here happens from here. But I, I'm, I'm not. You know, I'm not out there trying to save kids. I, I help bully kids. I'm a huge advocate for children. Um, you know, I love kids. But, uh, yeah, the, the whole save the children, I leave, those, I leave that kind of mission up to, like, uh, Tim Ballard and people like that who are really the brave ones going in and doing the missions. So, mm -hmm. me, I was just a messenger. That was it. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we're all part of this jigsaw, aren't we? You're yeah. the best. And not only that, if you – have been prone to depression and things like that, you can only do what you can do. You know, it's up to everyone to support each other now. You can't do it on your own. No one can do it on, on their own, as you understand. 100%. Don't you? Do, you? do you have a family? Do you have your own kids or? No, but I, but I want one now. Um, right. I'm gonna wait till after this election. <laughs> you know, I'm, gonna wait. I'm gonna wait a little bit. I'm happy I don't have one right now. But I, that in my future, I definitely want one. I want to have, I would love to have three or four children and, and uh, you know, wife and kids. But they, it's, 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 I would say I'm about a year or two away from yeah. actually making that final decision and doing it. Uh, I've always been a guy that likes to plan things out and be organized and um, have a strategy. So I don't just blindly fall into anything because that's where you mess up. It's like a fight. You know, I like to train for a fight, go into the fight and win the fight. So, um not that I look at marriage like a fight, or is it? I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I just would rather uh, plan accordingly. Okay. And, and what do you do to switch off? What, what do you do to relax? I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't sleep well at night. Uh, you know, I work out a ton. I run. You know, running really calms me down. When I go run, and, I, you know, when I run, that's when I, uh, when I do cardio at the gym or something, that's what relaxes me for the rest of the evening. And then that's how I, that's really what calms me. And I pray, I pray the rosary actually. And the rosary calms me down as well. I pray the rosary and I run. Right. Right. Cause you have to have something you do to switch off. Don't you? And yeah. It's funny how conversations can come full circle. And we started talking about nature and growing things and the fact that you didn't have, you don't have enough rain. Remember in, in Texas, and we go to our allotment, and um, it's nature is just amazing. I, I mean, nature gave us everything, 
everything, every single thing, I believe that everything is preventable and curable. Everything, everything. Absolutely. When you look at our little allotment, uh, we know nothing, nothing about growing fruit or nothing mm. for food. And we went there, it's, it's just a month now, and we put these little baby uh, beetroots in, in the ground and these little seeds of spinach. And uh, anyway, to cut a long story short, they have grown like wildfire. I, I joke about it. You know, I do comedy. I do this character, mm. a Jewish Irish grandmother called Baba Bertha. And she says, oh, I got to call uh, Bill Gates, Gil Bates, she calls him, Gil Bates. The whole plantation is overpopulated. <laughs> <laughs> I use a lot of comedy, I have to, because, uh, but when you look at that tiny, I wish you were here, you know, I wish we could all be together, hugging and connecting, and it's just, I believe one day, we'll be just flying in our flying saucers all over the place. I, I agree. Everything has been withheld from us, and this is information that I believe that Trump is going to disclose to us, or something will disclose to us at some point, uh, probably by the beginning of next year. Do you believe that? I believe, yeah, he's going to release a ball. He's going to release a lot of technology or uh, top secret stuff. I, I agree that. I agree with that. Uh, but it's it's yet to be seen. Like I said, let's see what happens in the next you know three or four months, mm -hmm. and that's where I'm at. And also, unfortunately, I have another I have another interview scheduled in the next two minutes. Okay, so, okay. I need to so get on that, finish. right? I can't keep missing these interviews. <laughs> no, it was brilliant. I missed yours. Um, I know you time. missed it a few times, but I'm so happy that I got you here. It's been incredible. Thank you so much for You're very welcome. such incredible information. And um, I thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in to watch David uh, Nino Rodriguez. What You're an incredible guy. It's beautiful to have you. You you shine. You shine. You have a good you. personality and a lovely smile. And uh, so go off and have a beautiful interview. And uh, we're very, very, very happy to have you here on Moving On TV. And hopefully one day, by the time you get to our plantation, everything, everything will have trees, you know. Hopefully. <laughs> all our stuff. So take care, David. It's been a pleasure and lots of love. And uh, yeah, just. Right, what a great interview. What a lovely, lovely man. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, so please come on moving on TV. That would be cool, wouldn't it? Have David Rodriguez coming on here teaching boxing, <laughs> self-defense or something uh, to, to the young generation here. Um, as I said to him, moving on TV is the new mainstream media. And we're here for you. We're here for you to tell your amazing stories. Um, we have the mind body spirit shows we have entertainment we have comedy we have um the lauren hope glory show which is this we have hypnotherapy we have the doctors current affairs um just so much fun so much fun on this on this tv station and it's yours it's your tv station to come on and do whatever you want and we barter so I'm looking forward to seeing lots of you on here. Take care. Enjoy the Lauren Hope Glory Show. Subscribe, share, and like. Come on board, Moving On TV. Um, contact me, movingontv1 at gmail.com. And if you can, please donate. Uh, it's paypal.me forward slash moving on theater. Lots of love. Take care. Have a beautiful day or beautiful evening, wherever you are. Bye. She's all around, she lights up the room The colors, the colors are strong The love inside goes on and on Turns to lie.